Hello, everybody. Ooh, hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Edri's Twitter chat. We are waiting for our listeners to join in. And as we do so, um, I wanted to give you a quick brief on why we decided to host this live chat today on a Friday at noon in Brussels. Um, Yesterday, we had a major leak, um, a leak that was covered by press in Germany, in Brussels, um, all over the news. And it was quite um, shaking, the discussion around a particular law proposal. Um, the leak is a study commissioned by the European Parliament on a draft proposed by the European Commission for a new law. This new law is aimed at combating child sexual abuse. So I also want to give you all a content warning that the conversation does touch on a difficult subject and a very horrific crime. So if you continue listening, please do so mindfully um, about, about the type of conversation. Um, I'm joined today by my colleague, Ela Jakubowska, Senior Policy Officer Edri. She has been following the CSAR, the Child Sexual Abuse Regulation negotiations in Brussels and in member states for the past years. Um, and she's going to fill us in with some of the details of this leak. Um, my name is Andrea Bello. I'm the Head of Campaigns and Communications at Edri. And for those of you who don't know ETRI, it stands for European Digital Rights, and we're a network of 47 NGOs in Europe, but also around the globe. Uh, we work on topics such as information democracy, privacy and data protection, as well as open and inclusive tech. Um, and generally, um, our mission is to advance human rights and human uh, dignity in the digitalized society. Um, the reason I'm mentioning our network is because Uh, last year, uh, we uh, organized a open letter and it was signed by over 130 NGOs criticizing the child sexual abuse regulation. Um, this draft has uh, prompted us to launch a campaign called Stop Scanning Me. Um, this campaign asks the EU to do better for children, tackle the root causes of this horrific crime of child sexual abuse and preserve privacy and security online. You can visit stopscanningme.eu, again, stopscanningme.eu to find out more about this campaign. Um, but in the next 20 and 25 minutes or so, we will be looking into the leak um, from yesterday and we're going to discuss why is it important, what are some highlights um, from this leaked report, but also Um, what should a response look like when uh, when uh, we're looking at the European Commission and the European Parliament? So, Ella, I'm I'm turning to you now. Give us a bit of context on this leak. Uh, why is the CSAR proposal problematic, and why did this leak create such an uh, earthquake in the ongoing debate? Thanks, Andrea, and hi everyone. I'm Ella Jakubowska, a senior policy advisor at Edri, and following this very problematic regulation for quite a long time. Um, so yeah, maybe jumping in on your first question of why this leak is, is all over the news. Well, for anyone that thinks Brussels politics and, and EU lawmaking is dry, I think this is a really good example uh, that it isn't. Um, you already mentioned that there was uh, a report presented yesterday after the final draft of this impact assessment was leaked, and it's really caused a big stir. Um, The presentation itself by the, the authors of the study was, in, in my opinion, quite dramatic. We saw one of the members of the parliament say how unprecedented it is to have independent experts come into the parliament on behalf of that entire parliamentary committee and give such a damning assessment of a legislative proposal that's on the table. Um, there was also a bit of tension between some of those that were speaking and, and the MEPs really being quite critical and calling out um, some of the, the people that wrote the law um, in the European Commission for not even having read new impact assessment that at its heart says that those that drafted the law, the European Commission, aren't really doing their full job of properly assessing human rights when, when putting forward new laws. And this is actually part of a, a much bigger trend, I would say, of how the whole process around this particular law from a democratic point of view, has been wild. Right in 
uh, in, in last year, um, it was May last year, 2022, when this proposal was first put forward. And it was leaked even at the time that the review board that sits within the European Commission had said that there were some really quite big problems with this law, that it might constitute illegal general monitoring, um, that not enough has been done to show how it, it's actually a, a justified legitimate law. And that didn't stop them from putting it forward. And a lot of experts have really, really criticised this law, saying that it's not taking on board human rights, but it's also got no understanding of how technology works in practice. And it's not just Edry saying that, there's technologists, cybersecurity experts all around the world. And even a study that was done by the Technical University of Delft, where they pointed out how many misleading or untrue statements the Commission were making about the technology that underpins this proposal. So, you know, there's a lot of reasons why this has not been the usual level of, of democratic process that we expect and rely on from the European Commission. We haven't got the evidence that we're supposed to expect when new laws are being put forward. And for me, the cherry on the, the cake um, is that one of the most prominent people in this debate that is being listened to a lot by lawmakers is the celebrity Ashton Kutcher. Um, you, you actually couldn't make this up. So really, you know, even before this leak, uh, quite a wild ride to get to this point. Well, I mean, it sounds like, you know, from the beginning, even before the draft law was proposed um, within the commission, there was criticism, then it still went away. It, and, you know, people came forward to say, it's wrong, it's bad. Then false claims started going around uh, from the commissioner in charge. And now that it sits in the parliament, who, I mean, rightfully so, had doubts about um, the draft, he commissioned their report, which again criticizes the draft. I mean, how much criticism can you can you get, really? Um, but I want to go a bit into this particular um, study that the parliament commissioned. And um, I want to ask you to maybe point at some highlights because the criticism has been so so, so vast, unfortunately, um, that um, it, it's really worth uh, diving a bit uh, deeper into, into the points from this leak. So run us a bit through that. What, what did you uh, find when you, when you had a look? Yeah, so maybe first of all, just to say exactly what this study is, it's called a complementary impact assessment. So the European Parliament asked for it to be done because they felt that the assessment that the Commission had done was not complete. And these independent experts have been have been writing this study and we expect that it's going to be officially published probably next week. Um, but there are quite a few leaks out there of the final draft that we've been able to, to have a look at. And for me, I mean, there's a lot in there that I think is really, really important and that we're really hoping that the lawmakers are going to finally pay attention to. I mean, as you said, how much more concern needs to be raised before they put their foot down and say, this isn't right, this isn't democratic, we can't go ahead with it. Um, but for me, maybe the, the three things that really stand out. First of all, this study found that there's a lack of evidence that the proposal from the European Commission is going to help us as the, to fight child sexual abuse. In fact, in some ways, it's likely that this this law would make it harder to fight child sexual abuse because it would create a lot of extra work for police um, that's not going to help young people, that takes them away from actually investigating these crimes. So ultimately, if this law makes it harder to fight child sexual abuse, it's completely failing in its number one aim and ultimately harming young people. And so you know, some of the things that I think are really important that the study authors noted are that, for example, this law will make more effective investigation more difficult. You know, that's a very clear statement, clear conclusion that they've come to. And they also point out something that for Edry has been really, really important when we're talking about this law. And the authors said that it will harm teenagers who are consensually sharing images that could be classified as abuse material. This is super, super important because whether adults that are working on these regulations like it or not, young people do sometimes consensually share intimate images or exchange sex. That's, that can be and is a part of healthy, normal development, as long as it's done in the right way with trusted persons that that, that 
uh, you know, a selfie isn't shared with someone non-consensually, of course, that's very different. But as long as it's consensual, this can be a part of normal development. And one of the members of the European Parliament yesterday even flagged how, you know, if we start in effect policing the sex, the selfies that are by teenagers, this is going to have even more of an impact on queer young people who tend to rely even more on digital tools for this sexual self-development. So, you know, when we're actually thinking about whether young people are safer, when to be, you know, have their, their content, their contents of their messages, the things they say, the things they share with their partners or their friends constantly scanned, well, no, this study is pretty clear that it actually puts them at risk. And that's really supported by something that Edry has found, um, along with some members of the parliament, uh, we helped to commission an independent poll that asked over 8,000 young people from all across the EU how they feel about different methods that have been put forward to purportedly keep them safe from abuse online. And absolutely overwhelmingly, the result of this, this poll of 13 to 17 year olds is that they don't feel safer when their private communications are being routinely breached. And that if we had this law, Right, so we're back live um, after a interesting technical hiccup. Um, we are wondering why this happened, especially on a topic on chat control and faulty content filtering. Um, we managed to create a new space and hopefully have this conversation about a democratic deficit um, in some EU processes. My colleague Ella has just joined, so I'm also happy to see um, our previous listeners back in. Thank you for your patience and please, <laughs> you know, make your own decisions about um, this, uh, this type of uh, space takedown. Um, let's get back to it, Ella. Uh, we were talking about why content filtering is not great and it's not going to help fight the horrible crime of child uh, sick. Maybe, maybe I should not say that again, of CISA. Um, I wanted to ask you a couple of points from this leak around encryption. What did the, the, the report actually mention? How does the European Commission CSAR draft uh, touch on that? Thanks. Yeah. And uh, certainly odd that we would um, have our space spontaneously shut down right when we were talking about these things. So, uh, as you said, uh, we can all make up our own minds about what happened there, but you know, it's, it's certainly odd. Um, and for those that are joining who weren't on the, the previous part of, of this chat, um, just a reminder of or you know, to, to restate the content warning that we are talking about the EU's law on child abuse. Um, so we will be talking about these, uh, you know, really, really serious, distressing crimes uh, in the context of this law. And so please you know, be aware of that. And if you uh, 
don't want to listen to these kinds of things, I would we would advise that this might not be the right conversation for you. Um, so that's that's really your choice. So jumping back into it, Andrea was me about this this new study um, that has come out. In the previous part, I talked about how the study found that the EU's proposed new law could make it harder for the EU to fight child sexual abuse, ultimately harming young people and it also harming their sexual self-development and expression. Um, but another point that this study raised is how the proposal could destroy encryption. Um, encryption is really one of the only methods that we have to keep not just our conversations online secure, but so many of the online activities that we all rely on, internet banking and shopping. It's even used in national security and by politicians. Um, and it's a, a really effective way of making sure that nobody can snoop on, on our personal lives online, just like we have protections from snooping on our personal lives offline. And so in this study, the, the authors found that the proposal poses a really, really serious threat to encryption, to the fundamental rights tool of encryption, which a lot of people really rely on to stay safe. And also it is not accurately representing the way that these technologies work, because one of the things that we've heard from the commission who put it forward is that, well, we might not have the technologies right now, but they're to be developed. Don't worry, everything is fine. And as one of the authors of the study pointed out yesterday, well, we were promised we would have driving cars by 2020, and that hasn't happened. So, you know, and, and you know, widely available self-driving cars for every in this futuristic 2020 time that we were supposed to be living in. And so just saying that the technology will be there um, is not really sufficient. And so, again, this study was, was pretty damning that not only would encryption be really fundamentally undermined by this proposal, um, but also that that would be a really bad Thing to do right this is this is quite ludicrous so beyond the arguments um that you know would make breaking encryption such a bad idea you have this approach of avoiding structural solutions but putting a lot of money into solutions that you hope would come in the future that don't even tackle the root cause of this horrific crime it really it's really bad i think um but Thank you for, for going into that. And my next question is, is there any chance for this draft to actually be made better? Uh, what does the report say in terms of, you know, can it be saved? Uh, can, can it actually be tweaked, amended, so it does respect fundamental rights in the end? Well, it's based on the report and based on our work, it's very, very hard to see how this law could overcome those really big problems that have been raised. One of the things that really stood out for me in this impact assessment is the fact that for some of the measures proposed in this law, there aren't any safeguards that could make them okay. Because what the report authors found is that the, the generalized scanning of people's private communications that the law proposes are in contradiction to the essence of two of our human rights, um, the right to private and family life, and the right to the protection of personal data. And under human rights law, there are times where you can limit people's rights for certain intimate reasons with the right safeguards, but you can't violate the ESPA right, because that would mean that you are, in some ways, obliterating the, the very existence of that right. And, and courts will always uphold that, but that's something that you can't do. These are, you know, privacy and personal data are really, really important human rights for a reason. So that is that's what the study said, that privacy and personal data protections will be harmed to such an extent by this proposal that you cannot safeguard that kind of violation. Right. So, so, we're we're looking at something that... Wow. So is there any way to save the text in a way that it's, what, sh what should we do with it then, you know, like if it can't be tweaked because it fundamentally um, breaks down an entire, <laughs> the essence of a, a human fundamental right, what should we do with the text? Well, something that I say to, to the members of the European Parliament when they kind of ask me that is, well, if you cut about 95% of what's there, you've got something that you could probably legitimately pass. Um, and 
you know, th is that really realistic? Are we going to be able to cut 95% of the proposal? To me, really, that, that just shows what a bad quality proposal it is that we've got table. So actually, I would go back to something that we as Edgery, but also 130 other organisations that we work with um, have been saying all along ever since this, this law was first proposed, which is that we need to go back to the drawing board. We need to accept that there are not quick technological fixes to very complex societal problems. We need to look really holistically at this problem of CSA um, and you know, rightly recognising that it's really, really serious, really, really harmful. But there's got to be a better way to tackle it. And I think if there's going to be a law into this crime, into this problem, then it should be developed in collaboration with people who have the expertise on child rights and child protect protection, but also the digital rights folks, other human rights, so that we can take a really comprehensive and necessary and proportionate approach to this problem. And also looking at things like law enfor enforcement, judiciary, um, social services, welfare, education, because something that we hear time and time again is that young people are being healed when they report something that's wrong, they're not listened to, they're made to feel like criminals, and also police across Europe saying they're just not given the money and resources to actually tackle the criminals that they fight. So you know, that, that again goes back to, to what the study found, which is that in the current environment where governments are just not doing enough, not committing enough to tackling this really wide problem, there's nothing that uh, an internet, a piece of internet regulation is going to be able to do to improve that, that situation. So really, you know, looking at the right ways to make laws, I, I would say the best thing to do is, is to withdraw this law to recognize that it's just not politically feasible, feasible, legally feasible, technically feasible to go ahead with a proposal like this. And actually we can do better. You know, we've seen the EU come out with a number of really important, really landmark laws in, in recent years. The general data protection regulation is a, is a great example that we can get these, these complex, difficult questions right. And we're not there yet. Right. And I think you, you put us on the good track for on what would it look like, for example, if we would uh, take a holistic approach to this to this um, issue that we're talking about. But if uh, we're looking at the digital aspect of it, you know, it's worth also perhaps checking in with some of the experts that have been around for a long time um, who could help, you know, before proposing such a law, before proposing such a draft. And I know that, you know, I introduced Edri at the beginning for those new listeners who've joined in. You know, we're a network of 47 NGOs composed of experts in the legal field, in the technical field within Europe, but also beyond that, working at global level, we've been around for 20 years in Brussels. So we tried to meet with the European Commission while this um, draft was being proposed, uh, drafted. Can you tell me Anna, how many times did you manage to meet with, uh, with the commissioner in charge? Zero. <laughs> uh, we Have were, you tried? We, yeah, we were rejected three times. Um, we even made a little mini campaign um, called Has Commissioner Johansson Met with Digital Rights Groups EU? Um, because we really felt that it was important for our concern heard. And although um, we were able to meet with some of the staff working on the law, we thought it was really important to speak with the commissioner at the top political level, who is the one driving this legislative proposal. Um, and yeah, yeah, three times uh, we were refused, um, but we did note that you know, in that time, there were a number of big tech companies that she was in with. Mm. Quite, quite, quite a sad approach, I'd say, to to draft a law that is putting such a big focus on the digital aspect of um, child sexual abuse. Um, but I want to ask you something now, Ella, about the Parliament, because you mentioned what the Commission should do, um, but now it is the European Parliament that is debating it with two lead um, committees in charge of drafting uh, that opinion, the IMCO and Lieben. So my question is, what should the parliamentarians do now that they have this study, uh, well, what the draft of the study and the leak, what should they do next with it? Just to be clear, it's the, the Libe committee, civil liberties in the lead, um, with some mm -hmm. other committees uh, supporting them. I'm, if I were an MEP and, and I received a, an 
independent impact assessment that was this damning of a proposal that had been put in front of me, I would demand that they take it back and try again. Because I think as, you know, as a democratically elected representative who is there to represent the people of the EU, you expect that those that are putting legislation or draft legislation in front of you have done their homework. And what this impact assessment shows is exactly what we thought, that they didn't do their homework. They didn't come up with something that was lawful and practically feasible. So I would, you know, go that far as to say it, it should be sent back and the MEPs should say, no, we're not going to work on this. Um, we have seen already some MEPs, you know, a lot of MEPs actually taking a very critical stance and some of them trying to wrestle with exactly how you could amend it, amend this proposal to make it OK. And, you know, one of the techniques we've seen from, from some MEPs is just deleting huge swathes of the proposal. And yes, that's effect to to take out these harms, but is it actually effective in, in protecting children? You know, if we have to delete 90%, 95% of this regulation, that, that's not helping anyone. So again, that goes back to this point from EDRI and that, that 130 other NGO coalition that I mentioned, that like, we really do have a chance to do better. And I know from um, speaking to a couple of experts on child protection and, and children's rights, that for them, it's really, really important that there is this political momentum taking this issue of children's rights, children's well-being and safety seriously. And I think that's a positive that the parliament can take from this, that this is actually a chance to shine a light on this really, really important issue and then to work towards something different, something better, something that's much more likely to be effective, because this is an opportunity. You know, we, we've heard for years that, that lawmakers really haven't taken this awful, awful and seriously enough let's use this momentum let's use the fact that there are so many brains trying to to work out what we can do and and yeah try and do better because i think that's that's the least that young people deserve yeah and it, it's a really really good timing you know um we have european elections coming next year and we've had the year of the youth um last year so given how much importance uh, is put also on you know making young people politically active um getting them out there to vote building that trust in the eu project in the end that we want to do so much around elections so much around the european youth um year of the youth i find it very sad that such a proposal that you know has is tackling such an important subject ends up with mass scanning of young people's messages in the end. Um, and I think, you know, like our poll showed, people will no longer be politically active, will no longer feel comfortable to be politically active. So it seems like, you know, passing such a law before the election not only like disincentivizes young people to go out there and vote or to talk about who should be voted and so on and so forth, but it's it's also like a huge, um, huge um, issue for many, many types of civil society and politicians themselves. So, um, yeah, I hope um, that this political momentum and the opportunity that lays ahead will be taken and that politicians do see um, the, the value of taking the right approach to this and doing doing better for, um, for children and everyone. Uh, online finally thank you so much ella we've uh, gone through a carousel of um of discussions with a short hiccup technical hip hiccup in our in our uh, twitter space but i wanted to thank you for taking the time to have this conversation on the leak report uh from yesterday informing the parliament's um opinion on on the csr and um, for all the listeners, please do um, follow Edri's work on these negotiations. If you want to be active, feel free to write an email to my colleague Ella or myself. And of course, um, go there on stopscanningme.eu and uh, follow our campaign. Thank you all and have a nice uh, rest of the afternoon and weekend ahead.
a nice uh, rest of the afternoon and weekend ahead.